Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I've already done my thank yous and welcomes, but uh, just for the purpose of the recording, my name is Sylvia Clark and I work for the Queensland Minerals and Energy Academy. Today, we're joined by Dan Mulray, who's a metallurgist at South 32 Cannington. And he's going to be talking to you today about metallurgy um, and, how, and his role in um, to becoming a metallurgist. So I'm going to hand over to Dan now uh, to talk through, uh, to, to talk to you. Um, my colleague Jess is in the chat, is monitoring the chat box today. So if you have any specific questions for Dan, um, you can pop them in there. I can't guarantee we're going to have time to answer them. Um, but also just to pop in there, in that chat box, what school you're from and how many students are listening to um, that would be fantastic. So thank you very much and thank you, Dan. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks for the introduction. Again, sorry about the delay there, guys. Um, but uh, yeah, as Sylvia uh, mentioned, my name's Dan Moore and I work as a metallurgist, project metallurgist at uh, South 32 Canton. Um, so just a brief uh, introduction from me. Um, I grew up down in, in Sydney. I uh, went to school down there. Uh, I studied chemical engineering at Sydney University. Uh, and after that, I worked. My first role was at uh, a mine in the Northern Territory called uh, MacArthur River Mine. Uh, I worked there for a number of years as a metallurgist. Uh, and then uh, for about three or four years, and then moved on to Cannington, uh, South Korea, to where I currently work. Uh, so, yeah, as we mentioned, I understand you're doing a bit of chemistry at school at the moment. Um, it's a big part of what we do at Cannington, what I do in particular. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take you through quickly a bit of the context um, and sort of the main sections of the plant. Uh, you'll find that as we move into the presentation that uh, a lot of the chemistry takes place in what we call the flotation area. Um, just again, put a bit of to where that flotation circuit sort of sits. Uh, in the in the whole bigger scheme of, of the mine. Um, so let's just have a look at that quickly. Um, <coughs> doesn't want to work for me. Do you mind clicking through, Sue? Yeah, that's fine. I'll I'll do my best. Thank you. And just one more, please. please thank you okay so um, so with respect to south 32 um, we have uh, operations uh, all around the world uh, but on this screen now is just uh, some of the operations that we have in Australia um, and so Cannington sit, sits up uh, on the northeast there of Queensland um, and that's that's our location that's where I work at the moment excuse me um, as we move through. So as I, as I was explaining, we've got a number of different areas in the plant. So before we even get to the, the, the processing plant, um, what happens on the mine site is uh, we have an underground mine. So uh, you have two sort of uh, two types of mines, one's open cut and one's underground. Um, underground, uh, we, we dig down and, and go specifically for what we call stopes where we have the mineral and the metal uh, in high concentrations underground. So we drill down there and um, we do what we call a drill and blast. So we blast the, the ore up uh, into, into large chunks and then we bring that up to the surface where we stockpile it before we run it through our processing plant. So the processing plant itself has four main stages. So we have the grinding circuit, um, a flotation circuit, then we do some leaching and some um, filtration um, and then we have what we call a paste production. So um, if we, uh, so I'll, I'll run through those areas really briefly again, just to give you a bit of context for that one. So just a couple of images here, just to give you a bit of an idea about what these sort of circuits look like. So this is a, a circuit, this is our grinding circuit. Um, and in this, this circuit's all about just grinding up the, the, the large rocks into, into much finer, uh, size particles. That's just. Basically, it works like a big tumble dryer. 
all the rocks go inside, throw the rocks around, and they all break each other up. Um, and that, and that, like I said, liberates the, the metal from the from the rest of the ore. It's it, the grinding circuit's just designed to set us up for a flotation circuit, which I'll which I'll take you through shortly. So that's just a picture of um, <clears throat> what we call liberated minerals. So you can imagine that um, it, all those little pictures on the screen there uh, are sort of zoomed in versions of of little particles of, of mineral. So the colour represents the mineral itself, and you can see that they're they're on their own, if you will. So that means that we can pick out those bits of mineral uh, without taking any other material with it. So this is just a large, larger picture of our flotation circuit. So I'll take you again a bit more through that in a moment. Uh, these are just long banks. They're almost like almost like bathtubs with bubble bath, and 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 that's how we actually float the material out, the metal out of the out of the cells. And all of those, all of what you can see in those pictures is is like hundreds of cells, um, like little bathtubs that are all linked together, um, and they all they all are used to to pull the material out. So that's where um, our main extraction point is of our mineral in our circuit. Okay. So after that, what we do is we, we once we extract the metal through the flotation circuit, um, we basically um, extract some fluorine from our from our concentrate, um, and then we filter it so it comes out as a as a dry cake, and that's what our saleable saleable product is. So it's just to remove the water from that product. And once we do that. Um, that's trucked um, or railed out to the port where it's loaded onto ships, and that is is sold off around the world to um, to smelters where they actually take uh, um, concentrate and create uh, a metal out of that. So there's two other little parts of the um, of the plant there as well, our paste plant. So you can imagine that once we uh, drill and blast down underground. There's a there's a void underground, um, and so uh, we can't leave the underground part full of little holes. So we make what we call a paste, uh, and that's basically the the leftover material from after we pull the metal out, um, combined with some cement, uh, and then we actually push put that back down underground to fill the void. Uh, so it's basically like filling the void with cement, um, and that's the section of the plant that we we do that in. And that material, that sort of waste product from the plant, if it is, uh, if it doesn't report to the paste plant to, to go and fill the void underground, it reports to what we call a tailings dam. Uh, and that shot there is just an aerial aerial photo of um, of our tailings dam. We have three sort of main cells there, uh, and they're basically just big pits where all that all that um, waste material reports to. And it, it's been sitting there since the last sort of 20 years, and we just keep adding to that. Whoop. All right, so that's a bit of the context around around the plant. Um, so I'd like to just get a little bit more into into the metallurgy side of things. So um, what we have is um, so metallurgy. What is it? So metallurgy is sort of the uh, the study and the um, well, metallurgists sort of study and manipulate that process that I sort of took you through there um, to extract the ore. Um, we spend a lot of time. Out in the plant, um, moving th like with the physical plant and the physical equipment. Um, you know, you might imagine turning dials and things like that. So we do those sorts of things. Um, we also spend a lot of time uh, in the office where uh, we do a lot of the problem solving. So that's where we can collect a lot of the information from from uh, from the communication systems that we've got working, the process systems. Uh, we can analyze data there, um, and we can make some decisions there inside the office. So. Our time is sort of split between, split between those two sort of spaces. Um, ultimate, ultimately, our role is is to make sure that um, our business delivers uh, on the, uh, I guess in this case, the metal that we um, that we need to. So an example might be a a, a shipment will be sold usually in advance, uh, and so by a certain date we need to make a certain amount of metal uh, or a certain amount of concentrate. Uh, at a particular sort of specification for the customer, and so it's our job to make sure that the, um, the process can uh, deliver that uh, in time. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the first two parts there. Um, 
So to become a metallurgist, so uh, <clears throat> going back to sort of your, from your guys' position now at school through to where I am now, uh, when I was at school uh, year 10 through, through to year 11 and 12, I, um, I chose five uh, subjects or five or six subjects. So I studied uh, advanced English, two units of English. Because I went to, to, to school in, in Sydney, uh, New South Wales, the, the structure and the terminology might be a little bit different for you guys up in Queensland, but um, basically I did an English. Um, I also studied chemistry for 11 and 12. Um, I did physics as well. Um, I did what's called uh, extension to maths. So that's the, the highest level of maths you can do at, at high school. Um, and I did an economics as well. Um, I just I did those subjects because that was uh, I enjoyed those subjects and I and I found that I was um, probably a bit more naturally uh, aligned with those subjects rather than others. Uh, so my sort my strength sort of lied in, in that space in, in those sort of subjects. Um, becoming a metallurgist. So unlike a lot of people where they um, I mean a lot of you guys might have also be in a position where you don't quite know what you want to do. Uh, and that's perfectly fine and probably quite normal. Um, for me, I didn't know I wanted to be a metallurgist. I, um, I studied after school, moving from those subjects I outlined through to doing chemical engineering at Sydney, even at that point. I, um, I didn't actually know that I wanted to be a metallurgist. Uh, I studied chemical engineering for similar reasons um, as I, I chose the subjects I did. Um, I enjoyed chemical engineering. I found it challenging and I found it interesting. Um, Chemical engineering, you can do a chemical engineering degree down in Sydney. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of metallurgy uh, components to it. Um, if you do chemical engineering in Queensland universities, you'll find that they'll have a, um, you can either study metallurgy or you can do chemical engineering. And I'm pretty sure you can do some majors in, in metallurgy as a sort of subject. Um, chemical engineering itself is, is a bit more broad. Um, I did a lot in sort of oil and gas as well. Um, and a few other different areas, um, so not just around metallurgy. Uh, so yeah, I found that particularly interesting that I could do a number of sort of different things with chemical engineering. Um, I went to school, went to university, a friend there in, in first or second year, uh, he was a year ahead of me and uh, at university and graduated a year ahead of me. Uh, from from his from university, he moved on to uh, the first mine site I worked at, which is uh, MacArthur River Mine in, in, in Northern Territory. Uh, and so uh, he was there for about a year and I graduated, he, he called me up and said, um, Dan, you know, I've been, I'm enjoying what I'm doing up here. Uh, I think you'd, you'd really enjoy it too. Would you like to, would you like to give it a go? Uh, and that was how I got into metallurgy. Um, it wasn't something that was um, uh, staring me in the face. It wasn't, it was sort of something that I, sort of considered but it wasn't um, sort of was there with one of the things I, I thought I would enjoy I didn't also know much about it as well so um, a lot of my motivation and understanding about what that role was about uh, came from came from a friend of mine uh, and so I took his um, advice on that and I, and I went up there and um, started working with him and the team up there uh, and that was how I, I moved into metallurgy um, so around metallurgy one of my favorite parts of the job so <clears throat> One of the things I, I love about about being a metallurgist is that you we actually are um, quite an, a core part of the business in that you find that metallurgists are linked to all different parts of the business. Um, so, for example, I speak uh, regularly regularly with um, the mining uh, teams, uh, the geologists, uh, the processing operators, uh, and the business. Uh, corporate as well um, because at the end of the day we're running a business and uh, we as the metallurgist help bridge that gap between uh, what the business needs and um, and the actual physical process itself and I find that really really interesting and, and really rewarding. Um, so that's a little bit about metallurgy and I just want to now move into a little bit of the, um, the chemistry components um, and where that sort of sits in, in the work we do. So some of these words you don't need to know, um, and they'll probably be difficult to pronounce. But I've got three um, reagents there on screen uh, in the bold there, um, and so 
we say reagents or chemicals that we use. Isobutyl carbonyl, which is just we call MIBC, um, sodium methyl xanthate, which we just re refer to as xanthate, and copper sulfate, three very important ones. And um, all these, all the, well, these three sort of chemicals here, all do very specific things, um, and they're also done in, and they're also uh, dosed into the circuit in very specific order. Um, so this part needs to be spot on in the plant because again we're looking at flotation here and, and in order to extract the metal and be um, uh, specifically extracting the metal and not other gang material uh, we have to get the chemistry right. Uh, the other thing is that the ore is always changing a little bit. Um, the amount of certain minerals are always up and down and so the amount of reagents we use always changes. Um, so I'll, I'll take you through a few of those just quickly. So we have uh, MIBC, um, so we use that as a frothing agent. So uh, what happens is the, all the material sits in, in a, like a little bath. Um, it's agitated, a bit like making a milkshake. Um, and then we run air through it and the air bubbles come up through the cell and the actual the minerals, the metal, actually bonds to the air bubbles and is collected by the, by the bubbles. So you can imagine a bubble bath with the bubbles or overflowing over the bathtub edge. That's basically what we're doing. Uh, but in that in that bubble, in those bubbles, we have the mineral entrained inside that. So the MIBC is, is what we cover, and it just strengths and strength strengthens those bubbles so that they can actually form and, and we can actually uh, they actually allow them it's strong enough to be able to move to the top of the cell and, and over. Um, actually another one there is that there was um some of the questions asked are around um, you know, some of the properties of these chemicals. So uh, outside of their, their perhaps their use, uh, one of the things about MRBC is it's, it's, um, it's quite a hazardous substance. So it's flammable, it's explosive. So we have um, hazardous areas on site uh, which are demarcated, special areas of their own uh, for that very reason. So. Uh, we have to be very careful about how we, how we use these chemicals and how we store them. So understanding that is, is, is very important as well. Uh, one of the other chemicals here, again, um, it's probably a little bit advanced, sort of the, 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 sort of the, the picture there that I've got, uh, but that's the, that's, that's the structure of the chemical. If you continue on um, with the chemistry uh, in 11 and 12 uh, and for the year eights uh, all the way through, um, you'll understand a bit more about what you're looking at there, but <clears throat> that's what it looks like. Uh, sodium methyl xanthate, so it's probably the most important reagent we use on site. Uh, and it's, a, it's what we call a collector. So it basically um, <clears throat> means that it, it basically, its function is that it bonds to the air bubbles and the mineral at the same time. And without it, the mineral can't bond to the air bubble. So we've got the frother in there to help with the air bubbles. And then we've got the xanthate here that cling to the air bubbles and the mineral at the same time. A bit like how a detergent might work in your kitchen. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to wash your dishes with just water and you've got some grease, some oil on there, that it doesn't, it doesn't, that it doesn't work too well. Um, if you add the detergent, um, it can bond to both at the same time and hence you can clean your dishes. So it's, it's got that ability to bond to both the air bubbles and the mineral. Another really important thing. Similar to the MIBC, the Xanthates, um, extremely flammable and it's actually quite poisonous. Um, it's one of the another one of the most dangerous uh, uh, chemicals we have on site. Um, very widely used in mine though. Um, I've, I've seen it being used. I've read books that have that are dated back to the late 60s where they've been using this this chemical. Um, so very very good at what it does. I think um, one of the other points here is that um, when we talk about the properties of xanthate, <coughs> you can see there that Zigzag through the through the picture there of the of the the picture of the the, um, the molecule, and you can get different size molecules. So maybe again, maybe a little bit advanced uh, at the moment for what you're studying, but um, you've got at the longer the chain gets, so you can have a sodium methyl xanthate or ethyl xanthate in this case, 
or propyl or butyl. So the the, long, the more um, the longer the chain, the stronger the, the chemical is. So it's it's able to grab the mineral um, better, if you will. And so just last the last one there is sulfate. So um, this one is um, is also very important. So what we do in the flotation circuit, we have lead, zinc, and silver. The lead and the silver we float together, uh, and we do that first. Um, the reason why we do that first is because the lead and the silver, um, those minerals can bond to the xanth that we just spoke about on their own, but the zinc sulfate requires something else in order for that mechanism to occur, and that's where we use the copper sulfate. So we float the lead and the silver out first, and then we pass the material through, and then we add copper sulfate, and then we recover the zinc second in the same fashion. That um, that equation there uh, is basically is is basically what happens and and how this copper sulfate works. So we've got a zinc sulfide, so that is our zinc. We recover zinc not as a zinc metal, but as a zinc sulfide, which is a, which is a mineral called sphalerite. Um, and so that zinc sulfide, that's the mineral we're talking about. Um, and all that happens is the copper sulfate then basically an ion exchange that swaps out on the surface of the sphalerite so that the surface of the sphalerite is covered in copper. And because then it's covered in copper, we can then use the xanthate. So it's the, it's, it's the fact that the properties of the xanthate and the bonding between the, the xanthate and the, and the sphalerite are not very strong. But if you put the copper on top and then use the xanthate, very, very strong. Um, and so that's what we use that for. It's a it's really nice blue substance um, uh, and, and it also very widely used. Uh, so again, I know you're learning a little bit about how to represent um, uh, reactions through equations and that's one there on screen that um, is, is absolutely um, crucial to, to floating the zinc in our circuit. Without it, you, we, wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to make any zinc. Sylvia, do you have that um, video there? I had it uh, available. Is that um, going to work? I'm just, I'm just conscious of the time. Yeah. Um, sorry, Anne. So, um, yeah. I'll just mention that there is some really great videos um, on YouTube. So we had one that we wanted to share with you today. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, that does show all those bubbles um, and how they're used to to separate as Dan's like very comprehensively explained. So there are videos available that you can just, if you type in froth flotation, you'll you'll find those videos there. How much longer do we have, Sarah? Five minutes? Yep. Okay. All right. Let's fly through the next little part for us. So just one more area briefly, guys, is the, is the leaching circuit where we use a lot of chemistry as well. So we have a reactor there. Um, and, that, and this, this circuit's designed to remove fluorine from, uh, from our concentrate, from our product. And so to do that, we, we use three things. We use aluminium sulfate. Uh, we lower the pH to three and a half to four. And we, use, uh, we run the, the reactor at a temperature of 57. So that's a good example of where um, we use temperature as a catalyst for, reaction, for the reaction. So the, um, it's very important to us that once we make the material, we'll, we move it out as, as fast as we can, um, obviously to make as much as possible. And so that temperature enables that reaction to happen faster and hence we can move material out faster. On site, we use aluminium sulfate. We actually make that on site. And down the bottom there, you can see um, a, a good example of a worded equation, um, uh, an equation down the bottom there as well, which represents the the, the reaction that takes place to make our alum sulfate. So uh, very important we get that right as well. So I might um, flick through this one. So I've got, you can view this one later. I think there's, um, this is just a little bit about what we use, what we use the, the, the metals for and where you might find lead, zinc and silver in everyday items. So I guess briefly, um, electronics are a big one. Um, uh, for particularly for silver, um, for lead, lead acid batteries in cars, very, very common. A lot of our lead goes to, to that area uh, in Asia particularly. Um, and with, with zinc, uh, a very good um, uh, metal to use in alloys uh, for you know, steel structures, bridges, um, and it's also a very good 
um, uh, sort of sacrificial anode often used around um, areas where water and steel are together. So I'll let you go through that at a later date just to, for the time. Um, so just on the rehab, there was, a, there was a question there about that. So yeah, look very briefly. So just lastly for me, uh, just one more minute. Uh, sorry, sorry yeah. Dan, I'm not sure if other people had this problem, but you, you cut out while you were speaking about rehabilitation. So I only saw the slide come up and the next thing I saw was you changed the slide to, to this one. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if other people might have had the same issue, but if you don't mind just going over that, that again. Yeah, sure. Thank I was you. just saying there that... that um, that it's very heavily regulated. Um, I was involved at MacArthur River actually with a, um, uh, an environmental impact study all about what happens when the mine closes. So um, yeah, heavily regulated. We have closure plans, planning teams in place that look at all sorts of different things around um, removing infrastructure. Sometimes in some infrastructure we want to remain, perhaps um, there might be electricity or water that will benefit communities and we'll leave that there in place. But yeah, there's, there's, there's always a team in place and resources in place, um, always developing to make sure that when the mine closes, um, we can, we can re-naturalise the area appropriately. Okay, so just yeah, my last little comment to you guys would be this. Um, you know, uh, it's been a little bit rushed here to, to going through all this stuff. Uh, it would have been nice to show a couple of videos there, but um, I would like to say that um, you know, just express how important the, the school is that you're doing um, and, and how important all of the subjects you're doing are. Uh, and for me, I think that um, the, the subjects, not just the chemistry and your science, but the maths, the English you're doing, um, all help to build, you know, foundations for your other study and other work, and they're all important. Um, they, they, develop, they help develop your way of thinking, uh, your, your critical thinking and your problem solving. I know perhaps a lot of other people have said this to you, maybe your parents or, or friends or whatnot, um, but it is, it is, it is true uh, and it happens without you almost even knowing it's happening. Um, so, yeah, it, I really encourage you to just give it your all into these subjects um, because it helps, it helps you be well-rounded and help you think in all these different ways and they'll be very important to you. Um, and those sort of things are also very important in the workplace. Uh, if you need to write a report on something, um, it's all well and good to know what you're talking about, but if you can't communicate it um, effectively, then it won't be as powerful. So, uh, so all these sort of things come together, and they're all important. Extracurricular activities as well. I'd encourage that. Um, they help build your communication skills and your ability to work in a team. Um, again, you've probably heard that before, but absolutely true. Um, I've taught since I was a rugby team since I was nine years old and involved in all sorts of different things. Um, and yeah, very very important. Um, and, and they're fun as well. So, um, yeah, my last words would be, yeah, just, just work hard and save the system because a lot of these things, when I mean, you look at the chemistry that we're looking at there, it might be a little bit, you know, overwhelming perhaps, but it, it isn't as you move through it one step at a time. Just keep working hard at it and, and be persistent. Um, I've failed at, at, at subjects before. Uh, I've done very well in subjects before, but keep being persistent, keep working on it um, and enjoy it. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you so much. I know we had to kind of speed through that. Um, Dan did a very good job answering questions as we went through the presentation. Um, so answering questions about rehabilitation, also looking at how those metals that are extracted are used in our everyday lives, you know, how silver is used. Um, you know, it's a very good conductor of electricity. So being a, you know, it's very good for use in electronics, things like solar panels. Um, I, you know, I know we've, there was a lot of information in there today. So if you do have any questions moving forward, please wait to send them through, um, send them, tell your teacher about them. And then, you know, you can send them through to me. I can ask Dan, we can get that information to you, you know, moving forward. 
So I, th I think that pretty much sums us up. Um, Dan's done also a really good job today of talking about, you know, his pathway to becoming a metallurgist and what it's like to be a metallurgist. I just want to let you know that on our website, awesomeresources.com, there is a section there all about different careers available in the sector. So not just metallurgy, all other types of things as well, if you want to um, check that out. And this is just a little in, little bit of information there about QMEA. Um, again, thank you all so much for participating today, for listening. Thank you to Dan um, for presenting. Um, I, know, I know we've probably all got to rush off to class or lunch now. So um, thank you all very much. And um, we'll talk to you soon.